Uh, would you take out your Bibles and would you turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 6? 1 Corinthians chapter 6. First Corinthians chapter 6. I'm going to start with verse 18 to the end of the chapter there. First Corinthians chapter 6 starting with verse 18. The NIV reads like this, Flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a man commits are outside of his body. But he who sins sexually sins against his own body. Did you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought with a price, a very high price at that. Therefore, honor God with your body. And if you would, uh, just flip over just a few more books of the Bible to Philippians. Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Lord, we thank you so much for your word. I thank you that it is applicable to our lives. I pray that you help us today, Lord. I pray that you, you help um, our hearts today in, our, in a culture that is, that is such sex-driven, Lord. I pray that we become counterculture. And it be in your son's name we pray. Amen. We're in a series called Hurts, Habits, and Hang-Ups, and we're exploring the freedoms of the things that might keep us in bondage. And uh, one of the things that I think that is important for us to talk about, as awkward, uh, this is kind of hot, if you don't mind just turning it down just a little bit. Um, thank you. Um, as awkward as this might, uh, this topic might be, um, I think that it's a very important, very important, no matter what gender, no matter what age, um, maybe that I know that some of you had sent your children to children's church but, but this is to inform parents as well of, of the accessibility the dangers of the things that are out there um, that you can be uh, that without you even knowing it accessible to and I think this is a very difficult subject but a very important subject for the church and some of you are probably already saying, I don't know if this sermon is going to help me much because pornography isn't my issue. But I can promise you someone that you love or somebody that you sit next to or somebody that you uh, care about struggles with this of some sort, shape, or form. Whether that they struggle with it personally or have been a victim of some sort of abuse as a result of pornography. And so the word pornography comes from a Greek word, and I know every single time that we've been in the series, I've pulled out a Greek word, and some of you have shut your ears off, but this is very important, okay? I, and I don't think that this sermon would make any sense at all without some Greek in it, okay? So here it, it is. This Greek word that pornography comes from is called porneia. It is found 26 times in the Greek New Testament. It means fornication. And sometimes it's tra translated, translated as simply as sexual immorality. And sometimes it's translated as sexual sin. And this in this time, in this passage that we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, Paul says, run from porneia. He uses these two different terms that, that, that go along with it. The word that, that stands out to me is run from 
porneia. Run. Don't just turn your back from it. Don't just brush it off. Don't try to, you know, look the other way. He says, run away from porneia. Now, if you're like me, anytime that you've heard this word fornication, sexual immorality in the church, if you're like me growing up, I, I heard that a lot. Um, I don't know, uh, I know Tiffany, Tiffany was raised in church, Ben was raised, Ben, aha, uh aha, -huh, uh -huh. I was going to say, I don't know who else in here whenever they were a teenager went through um, uh, this, this step study type of thing called True Love Waits. Um, Tiffany, did you go through it? Uh, ben went with it, through it whenever uh, I was teaching it, whenever he was a youth in my youth group. That's pretty cool, Ben. I forgot about that. Um, and the sad thing about that is that Cassandra went through with it as well whenever I was her youth pastor. <laughs> anyway, uh, moving on. So uh, there was this idea that this whole idea of fornication and the talk about it in church just had simply to do with sex outside of marriage, sex before marriage, sex somewhere outside of the boundaries in which God has positioned it for, um, to be holy, to be pure, to be clean. And if you were like me, thinking that that's what fornication, the definition of it is, then you're only partly right. Like me, I was only partly right. That's what fornication meant. And sometimes this, um, it, it includes that, but it's much more than that. It's the same, same um, is true about pornography. If you, um, if you thought pornography is just simply looking at naked pictures of somebody in seductive poses trying to get you to be aroused, then you're only partly right. It's much more than that. If, you, if we stem it from the Greek word porneia, in the Bible, it is a way of thinking. It's not a way of seeing or what you see visually. It's, what, it's a way of thinking. Porneia isn't about what we see in the naked pictures. Porneia starts on the inside of us. It's what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 15 when he said, Out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murder, adultery, and sexual immorality. And whenever he said sexual immorality, he also said porneia in the Greek. And that's how it, it is stemmed from. So out of this heart, out of the heart, whenever you put in, and I've heard Bob say this, I've heard other Sunday school teachers, garbage in comes garbage out. There is a, a, a popular song that came out in the Christian music uh, world. Garbage in, garbage out was the, was the name of the song. And it's so, so true that whatever that you put in, don't think that it's just about thinking these thoughts. Think about it as whatever that you put in is what you become. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Out of the abundance of your, your thought life or your heart, it's what you think. It's who you become. So whatever we put into our minds and our hearts, of course it affects us for good or for bad. It's not just for, for bad, but it's also for good. But it starts at our heart. It begins with our thinking. So we can draw this conclusion that Paul and Jesus wasn't just talking about men. Okay? We could draw this conclusion that, that, that whenever we um, read what Paul said, it, it talked specifically about a gender specific. But we can also draw a conclusion that this, in this form of thinking, in this form of being in our culture, he wasn't just referring to a gender specific um, about men having this particular problem. But it's women as well with the Christian grays that are out there, the 50 shades of gray that, that, is, that is out there. That there are cheap ways that women find objects, cheap ways to find objects other than their spouse to get aroused. So what the essence of fornication isn't just lust. Fornication is Seeing another person or another thing as an object, an object that is used for a means to an end. 
And in our situation, in our topic that we're talking about, the means is sexual gratification. And that's the ends. In this case, that means sexual gratifications. So as a man, whenever we see uh, a, a girl on, uh, whether it be the internet or a magazine or, or on our um, cell phones for that matter in this particular case, we don't necessarily see this as a woman. We actually see them as pixelated dots on a picture that this person isn't really a real person. It's just an object. In order for us to, to find a means to an end for our sexual gratification, we don't see her as a human being. We don't see her as a daughter of somebody. We don't see her made in the image of God. We see her to a, as a means to an end. And that's exactly what pornography is, and that's exactly what the Greek word porneia actually is referring to. Before an eight, fornication goes deeper than that, because in Hebrews chapter 12, Paul says, make sure that no one is immoral. And it's very interesting that whenever, if you read or are capable of, of finding some type of resource that uh, translates that particular word of immoral, Paul actually uses the word porneia uh, or for, fornication. Make sure that no one is involved in fornication or godlessness like Esau. He, uh, where he traded his birthright as the oldest son for a single meal. And whenever we think of Esau, we don't think of somebody that commits fornication, do we? We don't think of fornication and Esau. We actually think about this, <laughs> we think about this man's man, this hairy dude that likes to hunt, right? We, we think about this guy that, that, that knows how to move the rocks and boulders and, and knows how to plow the fields and stuff like that. And... Uh, and whenever we think of Jacob, we think of Jacob as, as um, Esau's twin brother that is kind of the more sensitive-like. You know, he likes to stay at home. He likes to cook with mama. You know, he likes to, uh, you know, do some of these things that maybe not necessarily every man would say, well, he's the man's man. He's like, uh, what's, what's the uh, mountain man? The, the TV show, what's... Uh, no, not Grizzly Adams. The, um, come on, Dad. Help me out. Throw me a bone here. Um, Jeremiah Johnson. That's it. Jeremiah, Cindy, good job. Thank you. Uh, Ten points for helping the sermon out along. I, I, whenever I think of Esau, I think of Jeremiah Johnson for some reason. You know, the, not the grizzly Adams, but the, the Jeremiah Johnsons that live off the earth. And so whenever we think about this story, we think about this Esau that went out to hunt and he was unsuccessful. And if you've ever gone out to hunt and you come back after a day uh, of, of hunting, you're famished. You want something to eat. And so he he had these hunger pains and he comes up and he sees his brother Jacob you know making this stew and uh, he's like hey Jacob give me something to eat you know and Jacob's like well what are you going to give me for it and he says well I'll give you I'd even give you my birthright you know just to have a a uh, a stew, you know, if, if Jacob, or if Esau was anything like me, I kind of say things like that in sarcasm, you know, and I don't think that there's a sense of sarcasm here that, that is going on, but, but Jacob's like, I'll take you up on that, sure, you know, trade me your birthright, and I'll give you a bowl of stew, and so what ends up happening is that he, Esau ends up trading uh, his birthright for a, a bowl of red beans, I can imagine. This is exactly what was going on. So he fills his stomach um, up with something that is immensely, immensely temporary. And he trades it for something that has immense value. Something that is immensely temporary and he trades it in for something that has immensely eternal value. Uh, Value for instant gratification. And it's an epidemic that is at the heart of porneia. Trading of something of great value for instant gratification. That is porneia. Eugene Peterson, I like how he 
um, he translates this Hebrews chapter 12. He says, watch out for the Esau syndrome. Trading away God's lifelong gift in order to satisfy a short-term appetite. You like that? I like that. Trading in a, to satisfy a God's lifelong gift in order to satisfy a short-term appetite. So, porneia is chasing after a temporary with no regard for the sacred, no regard for the holy, no regard for what God even cares about. That's exactly what porneia is. So even if a husband or a wife, a husband can fornicate with his wife. A wife can fornicate with her husband. Just because they're married does not necessarily mean that there are um, not boundaries within in a, a marriage situation because if a husband is just, if there's no type of intimacy between a husband and a wife and the only thing that they see is the wife as a, a sexual partner, then they, are, they have fornicated with each other. That's the only thing that they, there's no type of, of draw to one another. There's no connection. There's no covenant with one another. If, if only thing the relationship is based upon is sex, then a husband and a wife or a wife to a husband can fornicate. Wives, this is how you can do it to your husband. You can dehumanize your husband if you're always, always romanticizing him and comparing, uh, comparing him to the romance novels or the TV shows that you're engaged in. That is porneia. If you're dehumanizing your spouse by doing that, by just saying, that's just my object. It's my object that I use as a stepping stool or a, 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 a doormat. That's the basis of porneia. It's more than what we look at. It's also the way that we think. Therefore, how we begin to act in relationship to people around us, it affects that. And I want to just talk just a little bit, and I don't want to waste any of your time with, with this, because some of this you probably already know. Um, I want to talk just a little bit about the industry of pornography. Um, and I want to tell you how difficult it is, you know, just to research this topic. Because the things that you type in, even in, in, in uh, search engines, how easy it is to get you off on a particular um, track that it is not even the track that you wanted to go. Um, I was, uh, my, my kids love watching YouTube nursery rhymes. There was a nursery rhyme that my brother used to read to me out of this little black and white book that had this weird looking lady that was riding a goose. It was a Mother Goose book. And my favorite one that he read to me, and he did really good, was The House That Jack Built. The House That Jack Built. And it was like, this is the house that something to something to something to something to something to something that Jack built. And I couldn't do it, but I, if you read it. So I was just thinking, there's so many nursery rhymes out there. And so whenever I started typing in, I tried to take a shortcut to type in to find out where, where that is. Mind you that my kids are... To my right and to my left, I'm typing in the word house, H, they have suggestions and the pictures, O. When I type that in, there are sex scenes all over my, my screen. And I'm trying to type in the house that Jack built. Can you believe it? Can you believe that that is, is the thing, the worst case scenario that somebody could be possibly researching or searching for, that's the first thing that they throw at you. I'm so mad at that. So mad at our culture for that. In 2004, uh, there's this panel of these qualified experts that come before the state, uh, before the, the the United States Senate, and they present this. They say um, there is a product that is out there that is that is being consumed by millions of Americans and they're consuming it dangerously and it is dangerously addictive and the way that they have described this and the way that they presented it to the state senate is as if that they were presenting heroin 
or cocaine or some type of drug, some type of chemical drug like this. It says the effects of porn on the brain are toxic. That is their words. The component that, that high is similar to the high that you get off of cocaine. And I know that probably that you've heard that about Dr. Pepper. You've heard that about, you know, uh, Diet Coke or anything like that. that they're, they're highly addictive. But what they're talking about here, I want you to listen to this. The effects just aren't in your mind. They were talking about not just the high that you get in your mind. You might be thinking, well, pornography is just about a particular thought. But what they were saying is, is that it doesn't just affect them in their thoughts. It affects people that look at it physically. Meaning that what, how that it affects them, it, it affects their body chemistry. Meaning that, that if they use this particular venue to get a um, sexual gratification, uh, at the end, ultimately what it is doing to the body, it is training the body that this is the sexual chemistry, the body chemistry in which the body needs. The danger is how the addiction works. The addiction works where, you know, it, it starts with, you know, Sports Illustrated Swimsuit Edition, where there is a little bit of it covered up, and, and, and I, I, I hear on the news that the uh, Sports Illustrated this year has little t to the imagination, and it continues to progressively get worse, but we call it softcore porn where there is, you know, some imagination that goes with it. And the way that addiction works, and we heard this a couple of weeks ago, that whenever there is a particular satisfaction to get this feeling with this amount, then you have to go to this route to get this particular feeling again. And it progressively gets worse. It progressively gets worse. It goes from softcore to hardcore porn. And for most people that are addicted to pornography, um, something in the way that, and I don't know how to, other than just give glory to God, some people whenever they get to the hardcore pornography, can look at hardcore pornography and say, I'm, I'm in danger. Uh, if I go any further than this, I'm going to step off a ledge. Most people that are addicted to pornography that get to that particular po point can, can call out themselves and seek help. There's other cases in which that they cannot stop at just the hardcore pornography, where the hardcore uh, pornography, to satisfy this, goes a step further to where it becomes a little bit more like violent. It becomes more like even bestiality. It becomes almost like a rape type of thing to where, where, in the, where in order to satisfy this particular desire that it becomes out of control. And it's no wonder that we have a rape pandemic <laughs> where we have issues like that to where some people just can't say I can, I can stop at this particular point. Because that's not always how addiction works. It, it wants more. It, it, it cries out for more. It desires for more. And, and, for, and, and that's what addiction cries out. Here's the tricky part. We all have a God-given sex drive. Each and every one of us have that. We are sexual beings. Uh, we aren't sexaholics, but we are sexual beings because God made the human race that way. Made us sexual beings. Now, uh, the other topic is, is how, how, has, how has our culture... Um, identified what it means to be sexual beings. You know, if we're sexual beings, then everything is okay. If God created us this way, then everything is okay. Everything is permissible. Everything can, can happen. Multiple partners, same sex, whatever that, that might be. Therefore, whenever you and I indulge in our sexual appetite, outside the protected and good boundaries that God has given us, we're putting ourselves in real danger. When we break down the walls of self-discipline in this area, you get in real trouble. 
like all other addictions, it keeps asking for more. It can't just stop. Anybody know who Ted Bundy is? Not Al Bundy. Ted Bundy. Ted Bundy, uh, he was a serial killer. He confessed to killing 35 women uh, for sexual pleasure. Just before he was executed, he had an interview with Dr. James Dobson. And he, he, he says this in his interview. This is not Dr. James Dobson speaking for Ted Bundy. It was actually Ted Bundy saying, his exposure to porn as a young teenager began to unleash something inside of him that was beyond his control. He talked about this progressive nature uh, of pornography and how it kept asking for more. Then he says, he says this, get this guys. He says, it terrifies me to think about what is coming across the airwaves today. It is fueling the sexual perversions of our children. Some of what is being showed over the comfort of our living room televisions today is what would have been shown in X-rated theaters 30 years ago. Ted Bundy says this, a serial rapist killer. If that doesn't scare your socks off, think about this. Ted Bundy said that over 25 years ago, about 30 years ago. <laughs> that was before the internet. And you say to me, well, what has the internet brought to the table that something else hasn't? Well, right now, uh, there is an estimated, estimated 420 million adult websites, most of which are free websites. You don't have to pay a thing to look at them. 420 million adult websites that are out there. Some of that, that might not surprise you. It might surprise some of you. So what has the internet brought to the table? Well, I can tell you one thing, that it became a lot less accessible before the internet because if you were to ever to, to get pornography or whatever that might be, you, you would probably have to get some type of public, um, go to some type of public store, maybe that you'd put on some shades and maybe a fedora hat or something like that just to continue to change your appearance because it became kind of shameful to have to go into one of those stores and buy that. Or some type of subscription going through the mail that Mr. Chris Park would see would have to deliver directly to your, your mailbox. There was a little bit of shame outside of internet, but it, what, what the internet has introduced is that now you can get away with it, clear all the cash, clear all the, the history, and, and nobody would even know. And not only... You know, with magazines, what ends up happening is that with your magazine, that you could flip through the pages, and before too long, it ha you have chewed all the flavor out of that gum, <laughs> for lack of a better term. You've seen those pictures, and what the internet does is that that picture, you're done with that, you go to the next picture, 420 million websites that you can satisfy in the endless supply of flavorless gum. There's another thing that pornography does um, that is not just personal. It also affects marriages. It undermines the intimacy of marriage. And I think that there is common knowledge that there are secular marriage counselors that would welcome pornography into the marriage bed. I don't know if you know that or not, but it could, I, I feel like that it's common knowledge that there's people that, that would even suggest that. They would recommend that you have an active fantasy life. And, that's a good, uh, and that is a, a good thing to think about. With, with, in their minds, it's a good thing to think about that whenever you have um, intercourse with your spouse, it's okay for you to think about other people whenever you do. And it, maybe it needs, to, it needs to come in to spice up your marriage or something like that. Bring some videos to get everybody excited again. Of course, these are the same people... The same people that would say this are also the same people that say adultery in marriage is okay. You can have an affair every once in a while and it would help your marriage if you did that. The problem with that kind of advice is that the most sensitive and most 
powerful body part is our brain. And then a major stronghold of all sexual addiction is the grip that it gets on our sex life. So that's what Philippians chapter 4 is trying to tell us. It's trying to tell us is that it says, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is acceptable or, or praiseworthy, think about those set things. What goes into your head will go into your heart and that's what it's trying to tell you that eventually whatever goes into your head that's what you're going to become. Worst case scenario, like Ted Bundy. Ted Bundy that was willing to uh, freely admit what an issue and where it stemmed from. Whether or not that's what you intended on becoming or not, it's what you become. Whatever you put in is what you become. Once it goes into your head, it isn't enough just to stop it because once, once it's become into your heart and you say that I'm going to get rid of it, there's still something there that needs to be filled and you need to fill that with the goodness of Jesus Christ. You can't just remove it and think that's gone from my life because that was something that was intricately a part of you. And to just simply remove it is not just good enough. You can't just leave those things blank. I know some people, uh, I know a person that had come to me and said, you know, I don't have to look at another picture again. I've got a hundred of them in my mind. I also have another very, 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 very close friend of mine that would tell me and come to me and say, you know, it's, it's so difficult having sex with my wife, to be intimate with my wife because there are dozens of other ladies that come to bed with us. And not physically, but it's, it's the ghosts of other sexual encounters that, that this, this couple has to overcome. So listen to me. Listen to me very closely. The use of pornography, whether it is hidden whether it's done in secret or whether that it's done in, in open with, with uh, the permission of your spouse, always, always is counterproductive to intimacy. Always. Because this is what intimacy and the difference between intimacy and sex, they're not the same thing. Sex without intimacy is going to only lead you to frustration and dysfunction. God designed intimacy where there is a nurturing, there is a communication, there is this commitment, this tenderness and trust. And if you start practicing those components in your life, then sex will get very, very interesting because that's what happens whenever you have God's blessing in that particular marriage. When you are to say to your spouse, I'm going to do everything to be faithful and true so that you are the, mo the, the most eternal, the most important thing in my life outside of God's and mine relationship, I'm going to be intimate with you so that we can be sexual. I'm going to do everything in my power. And what pornography does is it reduces a marriage to just a physical act. Can I say that one more time? What pornography does is that it reduces a marriage to just a physical act. The more pornography that is introduced, the more that becomes just sexual and less intimate. Now you, <laughs> you might say, Kason, why are you telling me all this stuff? Why are you introducing this stuff to, to us? Uh, and I believe that it's important for us to hear. And maybe that you might be looking at me and you're saying, you don't need to go any further. I know that I've got an issue. I know, I, I know that there is a thing that is out there that I have an issue with, but is there any hope for me? Some of you might be saying pornography has not necessarily because of my use of pornography has affected me deeply but because of somebody else's use that I have been physically abused 
as a result of somebody else's abuse on this issue? Is there any hope at all for someone like me? Some would say, I feel trapped. I don't know what to do. I've, I've destroyed lives and, and, and I've destroyed relationships. Um, I don't want to let anybody know about it. Is, is there any hope for someone like me? And I'm here to tell you, I wouldn't be wasting your time this morning if I didn't believe that there was hope against the bondage of, of this thing called porneia. When Jesus died upon the cross, it was more than just to forgive you of your sin. He died so that he could break the power of sin's grasp in your life, which inclu includes breaking the power of your shame which includes breaking the power of your perversion, breaking the power of your guilt and, the, and distortion. Jesus, whenever he died, he said, it is accomplished. It is finished. It is over. Everything that sin says yes to or, or no to, the cross has said yes to and vice versa. Everything that, it, that, that sin has a grasp upon your life, Jesus says it is finished it is accomplished. No more do you have to wrestle with that. And I need to hear an amen for that. It is accomplished and it is available to every single believer. So now, through Jesus Christ, what may seem like a compulsive type of nature that might be, I'm just trying to satisfy my sexual desire as a sexual being, it's just compulsive. What might seem now as a compulsive behavior through Jesus Christ, something that we think that we cannot control, through his blood and through his resurrection, we can change. That's exactly what Paul is saying in Philippians chapter 4. He's saying, now you can change your mind about it. Through the power of Jesus Christ, because that he is resurrected, and because of his blood, there is a new thought process that can be applied to your life, and you can overcome that. And Paul says, we now know what is false. We now know what we can discern what is good and what is evil. We now know in our thought process and in our soul, know what to discern what is good and what is evil. I'm telling you, this is not a mandation of the church. This is not saying, this is what's bad. This is not the church saying, flee from this. The reason why that it is so important for us is because Paul says himself, because of the, the rampantness of the, and the accessibility of it, he says, run! Get away from this! Run away as far as you can from this! In other words, do everything in your power to protect your children, protect yourselves, because... In a culture where we say being sheltered is a bad thing. <coughs> being exposed is a good thing. The exposure that pornography has done to children even has warped and distorted our society and don't think that it won't land on your children. We need to protect them as well. So your involvement, this question might be, your, if, is your involvement going to involve your children? Are your children going to run across some of these things? And these things are life-altering. The exposure to these things are life altering. Secular psychologists would even say that exposure to these particular sexual um, images and stuff like that have life altering consequences. And that's not even a Christian psychologist. So maybe at this point in time, the only thing that I would like to do is just pray for us before that we leave.
And knowing that this is out there, and maybe that there, there, some of you have got a glimmer of hope, knowing that, that there is an issue and that it needs to be covered with the blood of Jesus, and there's particular um, habits that, that you, can, you can change in the progression and the cooperation of His grace. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the opportunity, Lord, to dive into your, room, uh, to your word, Lord. I pray that you dive into this room, Lord, and fill us with your Holy Spirit, Lord, and cleanse us by the, the uh, power of your blood, Lord. I pray that, uh, that you help us change our minds and our attitudes about what it means to live this holy life, walking alongside of, not just for ourselves, but for our marriages, for our children. Lord, I pray that even those that are single here today, Lord, I pray that they would find comfort in knowing, and not only comfort, but strength of, uh, of, of tomorrow and strength for the future, Lord. Lord, I pray that, that you sustain them as well. I pray that you go with us in the powerful and the wonderful name that you have given us all, Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Well, be sure that you tell a few people that you're glad that they were in church today. Thank you so much for your attention. Um, I love and appreciate each and every one of you.